Let's go ahead and get ourselves started again. What we want to finish up with today is really just looking at the whole issue of how we put all these boundary conditions in here and all these stuff was. I used to analyze this. And if you are very familiar already with using the structural analysis tools like ETABs, or I'll show you a tool called Robic Structural Analysis, you know, it's all about just transferring the information into those tools. Um, it's actually very straightforward. The idea is you put all this work into doing your uh, model in Revit as a building elements. You would like to go through and uh, use the structural model that's been generated, the analytical model with all the lines and the loads on it, to just go through the analysis tools directly. And that's what this whole next section is about. It actually is pretty straightforward if you have the right tools installed. So let's talk about this. In terms of working with you know, some of the structural analysis tools, depends on really what it is you're going to be working with. Uh, I tend to work with a tool called Robot Structural Analysis, which is an obvious product. And I use that because it's free and easily accessible and stuff like that. So I have that loaded onto my machine. And it works very well. There's a tool called the Structural Analysis Toolkit that exports directly to it. So if we go through and have our Revit model, we can use the Structural Analysis Toolkit to export to Robot Structural Analysis. If, on the other hand, you use ETABs, and if you use ETABs because you're very familiar with that in some of the structural classes here, there's something called the CSI X Revit Connector, which shares the model with ETABs. But it all starts with a little bit of analysis software. And for both of these tools, let's going to see if it's set up on your machines in here. I'll tell you how you can install this on your own machines. But the idea is basically we're going to take these models and just send them on over to do a little analysis on them. So if I go over to Revit for a second, let's see if I can find Revit. There we go. And I go to the Analyze tab. Check to see if this is true. Check to see if you have something in here at the tail end that says Structural Analysis. And within that, if you have a link to something called Robot Structural Analysis. Okay, if you do have that, that means the Structural Analysis Toolkit's already installed on your machine. If it's not installed on your machine yet, it's easy to go through and install. So check to see if that is true. If it is, you're in great shape. If it isn't, we can go through and add it in. So let's think in terms of folks who are here. In Revit, is it installed on your machine? No. Okay, anyone's machine here? No worries. Okay, how about let's take a look at the other one. If you want to send things over to eTabs, that shows up under the Add-ins tab. There will be something that says, export to create a new eTab, say for SAP model, or update, or kind of bring it back from those tools. So those are sort of available if you have that connector sort of installed. Okay, but let's talk about how you get these different connectors. Okay, the connector for exporting it to Robot Structural, okay, actually is loaded on the coursework website. I put it out there. Let's see if I go out to the files. And if under files, you go to software installs, let's see if it's out there. You'll find this thing called Structural Analysis Toolkit for Autodesk, Revit, or something like that. If you download that file and run the installer, that'll go through and make those available to you. If you're working on these machines here and you want to actually install that here, go ahead and use the super secretive, like uh, administrative password and username to go through and install it on these. And you can put it in there and that'll install that on your uh, menu bar. It's actually very quick. So if you want to go through and run that and put that in there, you can follow along with what we're doing now. Okay. If you prefer to go the eTabs route, I'm going to show you where you can find out about that. Let me go to Bimtopia. We put some information out on Bimtopia, where you post design journal articles, just because a lot of the uh, folks who are in Global AEC use eTabs to do their analysis. So under Global AEC, you'll find a few things about installing eTabs on your computer or sharing Revit models with eTabs. 
So if you already have eTabs installed on your computer, that's fine. You don't need to redo that. eTabs is not installed on very many of these computers, but when it's certainly installed on some, the idea is the big thing is you have to get to the right licensing server. So if you want to install it, if you want to go through and share your models with eTabs, there's instructions under this link. So first you would install eTabs, and then you would share the Revit models with it. So there's a link here for downloading the wizard, for installing it. The big important thing for both of these things, if you're going to work with the eTab environment, is that there's this whole notion of basically pointing to our license server. And this is the important one you have to sort of get to. You have to go through and install basically a pointer to the license server. The license server is actually located over in the center. Okay. And this will only work if you're on the campus network. So if you're on campus or even in the residential network, it'll work just fine. If you're off campus, if you live completely off campus, then you need to use a VPN to go ahead and get yourself connected in to use it. Okay. But yeah, for the most part, I would just install a new Google Robot Structural if, you don't, if you're not already familiar with ETABs. So they're really very important in terms of what they're doing. Okay. So let us show you what this basically looks like. Okay. So if you are installing the robot structural analysis connector, again, what it will look like when it gets installed is like this. So has anyone installed it? Was anyone following or is anyone installed it? Watch along. Are you there again? Okay. What you're going to do is. Okay, to install it, what you do is back over in the Canvas site, way down at the bottom of the list, there's uh, software installs, and there's the installer. You can download it right here. Let me download that. When you run it, it'll just put some things on your machine. It's actually a very quick little one, but for these machines, you'll need the uh, administrator name and password. For your own machine, you won't need that. Just kind of put it on your own local computer. So, looks like it's downloading. Great. If you go through and run it, let's see what it actually looks like. downloads. Where's my home drive? I don't see the home drive. sort of repair it, or you'll say install. It's actually a real quickie. So if you do, it puts this tool up over here. Let's kind of talk about what it actually does. The idea is you have this model, which has some loads on it right now. It looks like I only have a little bit of a live load on there. And what I would like to do is go through and export that and take it over to analysis so I can work with it. The analysis tool that I tend to work with, I use one called Robot Structural. Again, eTabs is just as valid. If you don't have Robot Structural installed on your machine and you want to work with that, it's just a separate install. If you want to get it, it is at the ever popular students.autodesk.com. And then when you say get free software, you can go through and download. Let's see what do I have in here? Featured products. Where's the all software? I keep on changing the site. Go back over here. Featured products, design suites. Oh, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, I read it. 
Where's the all products? I don't see it. The last, the last, the last, the last one or just your software feature product, mm -hmm. all products. Okay. <laughs> Any better at fight me? Okay. Uh, let's say robot structural analysis. Okay. And you can sign into this and download this and install it. Don't worry about doing it right now. I'll just demonstrate it for right now. But again, work with robot, work with Revit, or work with uh, eTabs, whatever you prefer. If you do download Revit or this, You'll basically go through or robot structural. You'll say do a personal license. Go through. Go for. You could go 2017. I would go with 2016 for now, just because all our software is in the 2016 version. Okay. Then you can download it and install it. Okay. I already have it installed on my machine, so I'll just show you what it looks like. But we'll get it installed on all these machines. That's all. Good thing to work on with the TAs. We'll have fun. Okay, so in terms of doing that, let me go through and to show you what robot looks like. And I'm sort of fighting. I shouldn't have moved that. Okay. Here's robot structural. Let me go ahead and load it up. What I tend to do is I'll open it up. Is there any of your machines or any of the cluster machines? I think we put it on some of them. It's probably not all of them. No worries. Okay. Basically, this is robot. When you first open it up, sometimes I like to open it in the background just because it often puts up a dialogue that asks you permission to go ahead and collect data and stuff like that. So I'll usually open it here. What I do is I come back over to Revit and I say, let's go to Revit. And if this analysis tool is available here, I'll say, let's go ahead and link to that. And what happens is it will take this very same model, the model hanging around over here, with the loads on it in boundary conditions, and send it over. So we'll say, let's choose that. We send the model over there. Just a kind of brief aside right here. There's the whole issue of some advanced things about, oh, you know, which case contains the dead weight or the, the self weight, and you leave that in the dead weight case. Um, if I had had uh, only a portion of my model selected, I could choose to only send the current selection versus the entire one. And that's probably what you'll end up doing, is you don't want to send the entire model, just a few things. But when you do send the model, make sure that you send a beam, some columns, and some boundary conditions, and a load. You have to you know, send it enough to make sense. Okay, but we'll give you some guidance when we need to talk about that. Say okay to that. Let's send it over to Robot Structural. What it's going to do is basically take all that stuff from Revit and it's going to send it on over, including the information about the sizing of everything. Alright, send. Let's we'll see what goes on. Exporting all that information. And when it gets all done, it should look like this. And now I don't want to see the events report. Let's go on over. Okay. Here we are in robot structural. So this is if you're using structural analysis packages, often the way things look, you can start to see we have different columns, we have the boundary conditions, we have different lines and all that kind of stuff. Now, Robot Structural is its own really very full-featured tool, and there's a lot of things we can do in here, oh, in terms of just displaying different things, like those are node numbers, those are bar members, numbers, that's the deck, that's the boundary conditions. This is the actual members. That's local coordinate systems. 
That's whether or not I want to see the deck. This is the whole notion of load symbols. And right now I have all the loads turned on. I'm just going to turn on the live load case. And there it is. There's the magnitude of the live load case. Okay, so I got a lot of information kind of floating around in here. Again, don't worry about all that. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. But at some level, we can choose any of these numbers and sort of see what the sizes are. For example, let me grab member number two. You'll see it's a column, it's a 10 by 49. And the reason we're going over here is really to figure out is a 10 by 49 adequate? Or is there another size that would be more appropriate? So here's the way it basically works. Think of these analysis tools as really having two components. On the one hand, they are great calculators. And on the other hand, they also can help you size and choose different numbers. So let's just go over the calculator functionality first. You might remember doing all your shear and bending moment calculations back in uh, the early days of civil engineering. If you want to do something like that here, what you'll do is you'll say under analysis, let's go through and run the calculations. Now, provided that your structure is supported and whole and all those things, we'll probably do a pretty good job of this and kind of come up with the calculations. Okay. It's gone through and created a lot of calculations right now. Let me go ahead and see if I can turn off that finite element mesh. That's just, uh, it'll get in the way as I'm trying to select things. Okay, it's done all the calculations for this case. If you'd like to sort of see what things look like, I can say, let's display some results. And let's put some diagrams on the different bars. So for example, if you remember what shear diagrams look like, let's go ahead and try that. I think it's going to be F sub Z. Okay. So those are the different shear diagrams on the different bars. You can sort of see on the intermediate bars, kind of going high, coming through, over here, high, coming across that way. These are actually set up right now, so the connection's actually transferable moment. So that's why it's a little bit strange right at the end. But that's basically the shear diagram. If, on the other hand, you like to think about things in terms of moments, I can display those. And you can start to see now, like, which of the beams actually sort of have the biggest bending moments on them. You sort of get a pretty good sense, as per your intuition, that this front beam, the rear beam, have the biggest bending moments. The other ones have, like, lesser moments on them. So if you want to, go through and even size these up and sort of see things under parameters. I could say, let's go and put some labels on here. Okay, Just the local extremes. So this is a moment of 34.82, probably kit feet or something like that. So it's a really good calculator. In fact, what it can do, all this calculation is really based on it is based on the actual size of the materials because how the loads got distributed depending on the relative stiffness of the different objects. But we can also go through and figure out what the deflections are. And that's often a guiding criteria as we're working. For example, I can say, let's show the deformations. Let me turn these off just so it doesn't look so cluttered. And you can sort of see what's going on there. That's the deformation of the slab right now. Let me try the bars. Okay. And what it's basically showing us is we have these different deformation numbers. For example, that beam right towards the front is basically deflecting 0.91 inches when at the extreme pace. Okay. I don't think about that in terms of whether that's acceptable or not. If it's a 30-foot beam and we use an L over 360 rule, that'd be 30 times 12 is 360 divided by 360, like an inch would be the allowable deflection. So that's just, at least for the live load case, just barely out of what's going on. It may not be stable in other ways, but that's one way of looking at it. And we can go through and change these different load cases. There it is in the dead load case. We can look at some sort of combination cases. 
You can even in here, if you prefer, let's do this. People like to do this. You can animate what the deformation is. You can have all sorts of fun in here. Your ever popular dancing structure. Okay, but enough of all that. Well, actually, I have to do this up here. <laughs> what we want to do is actually just sort of figure out. Now it's going crazy. Don't do that to me. Okay. Close you up. Okay. What we want to do is basically figure out the adequacy of all these members. And we can go through and do that too. We can go through for any individual member, like I'll choose this member across the front that we're a little bit worried about. And I can right click on him. Say, let's take a look at his properties. You can start to see, oh, there are the individual properties. So I can take a look at his bending moments or things like that. I can look at his displacements in the Z direction. So you can sort of see there, right about in the middle, it's going too close to uh, an inch. But one thing you can do is check it against just uh, the building code and what the requirements are there. And I can see that right now, this thing is a little unstable. And in terms of whether, how it's unstable, it could be unstable because it doesn't have enough area, because it doesn't have enough uh, inertia, a moment of inertia. It could be, um, you know, that sort of breaking and bending, it's over deflecting, it could just have sort of a kind of a stability problem. In general, what I can see though is that there's this ratio called the efficiency ratio, which is the rating of how heavily loaded that is. And you want to basically keep that below one. So something that is at an efficiency ratio of 1.16 is overtaxed by about 16%. Okay. So I probably want to go through and reduce or increase the size of that somehow, or go through and change its properties so that it's doing a little bit better. Now, some other members are actually doing good. Let's go through and grab one of these little intermediate joists. And I'll say, let's take a look at its properties. It's going to hang around with an efficiency ratio of 0.24. And what that means is, hey, okay, this thing is only using 24% of its capacity right now. So we can probably go a little bit smaller if I want and save a little bit of steel, save a little bit of cost, just because it's so underloaded. Similarly, the columns over here. What's going on there? About 0.15. They're really relatively underloaded, so I could probably resize some of those down. So the idea is I'd like to go through and optimize the steel a little bit so I'm really using it where it's necessary, kind of cutting out weight where it isn't necessary. And at a high level, the way that's done is under the design tab, there's something called steel member design. I can go through and just say, let's just do our member verification. Let's see what I have to do here. Hang on. Get you out of the way. It's members 1 to 13, all of them, for all the different load cases. Let's run our calculations. And I can see that, for the most part, most of them are OK. You see all these different sort of efficiency ratios. These two, those are the big long ones, are the ones that are in trouble right now. So those are the ones I need to pay some attention to. Okay. Next time we're going to go back and like uh, use this very same tool to go through and choose better size members. We can go through and say code group design and basically help us or have it help us figure out the best size member to, to uh, replace that group okay, based on where the criteria you want to. So this is sort of the uh, robot structural way of doing it, but it's pretty straightforward. Let's go back over and just so we can sort of see the E-tabs way too, though. 
go back over here for a second and take a look at that. If instead of going to robot, because I like to go with robot, but again, there's nothing particularly great about that. It's just a tool that I like. If you want to go to eTabs, what you can do is under add-ins, say, let's go through and export to create a new eTabs model. At some level, this looks very similar. So choose the things you want to export. It's going to go through and create that. Say OK. For eTabs, it creates an intermediate file. It creates an EXR file, which is an eTabs like export format. We'll set it on out there. And now, if I go into eTabs, see if I can find eTabs. Get you out of the way. Where the computers and structures go? SCXR, where did it go? It's funny, I have that part in there. I'm trying to see where I put the other rest of it. Did I not have it installed in this version? I may not have it installed in here. That's out on the web. That's not where I want to go. Interesting. I must have it uninstalled on this machine. Oh well, you won't see eTabs today. Uh, I'll put that back on there. We'll show you how we actually do the same thing to eTabs. But it basically looks very similar. We're going to go through and just basically pulling that imported model. We then have something that we can then uh, use to go through and size those members. So at a high level, what you should be thinking about relative to your structures is, let's kind of pop back out here. Where am I with Revit? Just where in your model makes the most sense? So think about, again, you don't need to put loads on the entire structure. You don't need to sort of put boundary conditions on the entire structure. But think about that point where you either have the longest span or you have some nice cantilever that might be interesting or something that looks a little bit intriguing where we can go through and isolate some sort of series of beams, a few columns, some battery conditions, put some loading on there, and just use this to go ahead and size that up. Okay, and when we meet, we can talk about sort of really what might be the most appropriate thing to look at you know, on your own structures. Indeed. Let us pause then for today here, and we'll go ahead and get some things loaded up on both my machine as well as on these machines in here, so we have some stuff to play with in terms of uh, just actually mucking around with uh, both robot and eTab, so we can all be playing around with that stuff. Okay, so let us adjourn for today, and I don't know, we'll just uh, be seeing you all like uh, in office hours.